Hi everyone, and welcome to 2023. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really believe in setting New Year's resolutions, but I definitely believe in setting goals for the new year. So this year, I wanted to do something fun and different in January to kind of help give everybody a little bit of energy and inspiration going into the new year. So all of the content on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all of our social media this month is gonna be geared at helping you to take your career to the next level in 2023. To kick that off, I put out a video on social media a few weeks ago asking you to ask me any questions you have about your career and safety, my career, how to make videos, how to get the CSP, CIH, any of those types of things. And this video is answering the most asked questions. Along with that, I wanted to give you some resources going into the new year that are gonna help you out. So number one, remember we have free downloadable Toolbox Talk PDFs at our website, allysafety.com. So definitely take advantage of that when you need to. Number two, I'm gonna give you a coupon code where you can preview any of the Ally Safety courses online for free. That coupon code is 2023XYZ. So if you ever wanna preview any of our courses, see if you like them, get some ideas for training in the new year, that's available to you. So check that out. I'll probably leave that up like a week or two, but not the full year. And number three, uh, definitely let me know what you think in the comments below. This is a really cool chance to interact with you guys. I don't usually have that opportunity unless we're at a conference, but there's so many of you out there that I've interacted with online or on social media that I've never met. So definitely communicate in the comments, let me know your thoughts, your questions, and we'll move forward if this kind of content is something that you like to see, we'll do more. If you're not a YouTube subscriber, definitely subscribe because YouTube is where I'll ask you questions. I'll do polls on what sort of videos you wanna see in the next couple of weeks, and it's a really good way to interact. So if you like this video and you'd like to see more content like that, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And without further ado, here are my answers to the Ask Me Anything questions. So the question that came up the most often is a great one, and it's how do we get people who don't care about safety to care about safety? The interesting thing about this is it's a big part of our job, and we really get no formal training on it. <laughs> so that ends up being a little bit of a problem. Approach it with the right mindset. There are a lot of issues at work, like machine problems, insurance problems, you know, policies, procedures, those types of things that can be fixed relatively quickly. People problems, on the other hand, take time. And as somebody who is not the most patient, I have to remind myself of that. People don't change overnight. So go into it with that attitude. First things first, when you go into an organization, if you have the support of the CEO and upper level management, you want to start working with them to adjust people's incentives. So let's say on their annual review, they have a line in there for how their safety key performance indicators are measuring up. Now, of course, we don't wanna measure on the lagging indicators like the number of incidents and illnesses every year. We wanna measure on leading indicators like positive safety improvements and participation in safety. If mid-level managers will have that on their resume or have that on their roles and responsibilities as something that is required as part of their job, then they will automatically start caring about it. So that is your best and fastest bet. That being said, that's not always an option and this can take like a year, sometimes two years to implement depending on the organization. So what you wanna do next is don't go in guns blazing, don't go in campaigning for safety, sit back and learn the organization for a little while. Now, when I go in, I try to find two, maybe three people who are influential in the organization. Sometimes those are the people you think they are, like managers, foremen, people who are in leadership roles. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just somebody on the crew who is very well respected. If those people who are influential are not believing in safety and not practicing it, you need to be able to work with them to get them to be advocates for safety. 
how you do that is you find out what their big motivators are. A lot of times people who aren't advocates for safety, it's because they feel like it's another thing to do and they're already too busy. So see what is really driving them and what pressures they're under and find a way to integrate safety in a way that's going to make their job easier. This takes getting a little bit creative. But an example that I've used that's pretty common is let's say you go into a factory and there's a machine, an assembly line that is really struggling and whoever's in charge of that isn't really advocating for safety. Chances are they're usually getting a lot of pressure on production. Now, what hurts production in these types of environments? Things like mechanical breakdowns, people who don't know how to do their jobs correctly, you know, maybe the company's had a lot of turnover or things like that. So what we can do here is we can align our incentives because when safety improves, so does productivity and quality. So selling safety is a lot easier when we can show that. People don't believe it when we just tell them it, but if we can prove it, then often we can really make the case for why safety matters. So what I would do in this case is work with whoever is in charge of that product line or that assembly line. And we would find the person who's been working there the longest, who understands the most about what they're doing and create a really solid, good procedure. Then I would work with the maintenance department to come up with a good preventative maintenance plan. Then we'd train people on it. And what do you do if the preventative maintenance plan needs to be activated? What do you do if there's a breakdown? And how do you run this machine like you know what you're doing? How do we provide the best possible training? Once a process like that is implemented, things start moving more smoothly. And this person who maybe didn't believe in safety initially can see the value in safety. So like I said, it's a long process, but changing people's minds often is. And if we really believe safety works, then we have to show how it works in a way that also improves productivity and quality. And a good safety program should do that. The next question was specifically about how do you deal with clients who want safety to improve, but who don't necessarily believe in safety. And there's this problem in consulting where sometimes people have had an OSHA inspection or an injury and they know that safety is messed up at their organization. And so the first thing they jump to is, okay, let's call a safety consultant to help us with this. So you go in, you point out what's going on, and they don't make any changes at all. Now the problem with this is it's exactly like if you called in an accountant to come do your books. If you called in an accountant, they went through all your books, they looked at what you're spending versus what you're making, and you were spending way more than you're making, and they gave you some suggestions on where to cut back. You looked at them and you thought, "Mm, I don't really have time for that. Then you're still going to have the same problem next year. And safety is the same way. You can call in a safety consultant to help. We can get down there, boots on the ground, tell you exactly what you need to do, work with your employees. But if you're still not caring about safety and employees know it and it's showing, nothing's going to change. So if you want safety to be successful, you need to work with your consultant and you need to be ready to integrate safety into your organization. The next most common question all was about how I ended up in safety. So this is kind of a fun one because I think like so many other people, I ended up in safety by accident. Like I never set out to become a safety professional. I grew up in a family owned logging and excavating business. And uh, I had learned how to run several pieces of heavy machinery, had done a lot of manual work for my dad growing up. And uh, when I went to college, I knew I really needed a practical degree. So the best school that was close to me was Montana Tech, which is an engineering school. Um, And I ended up starting out in petroleum engineering. And I did my first year summer internship in Bryan College Station, Texas, uh, in the oil fields. And I loved working in the oil industry. I still think it's like a fascinating combination of fluid dynamics and geology and all this really cool mechanical stuff. Like, it's a ton of fun. But I had come from like a poor town in Montana where the mine had shut down and the economy was really difficult. So going from that to working in the oil fields where they would spend like $1,000 on a dinner for interns, it just blew my mind. It, it was like a what probably the biggest culture shock 
I have ever had. And I've traveled a lot. <laughs> but um, I remember I was like going to check out some piping factory with another engineer and he had a Hummer. And we're riding in the Hummer and he's like, I bet you've never ridden in a Hummer before, huh? There's just like a lot of that sort of attitude. And although I liked the work, I ended up spending a lot of the summer changing oil on the pump jacks with a mechanic, um, which was cool, but I felt comfortable in that role. The rest of it was really overwhelming to me in a way, just because there was so much money and a lot of ego. And I just, <laughs> I was young and naive and wasn't used to it. So when I got back to college, I changed my degree several times from like <laughs> petroleum engineering to geological to geophysical and all these different things. I was really into geology, but um, it, nothing was a good fit. And so eventually I took an aptitude test and they said I should be in safety, which they had a safety program there. And I was like, oh, I do not think I would like that. But then it was 2008 and the economy crashed and uh, I had bought a house that I was fixing up during college uh, to make money. <laughs> I couldn't make the payments, even though they were like only a couple hundred bucks a month. So I really needed a job. And I took this job out planting trees on a super fun site. And we had to do manual tree planting. We had to plant 600 trees per day in super rocky ground where there was no shade. It was snowing in June. If anybody knows Southwest Montana, like you get these crazy storms and it's either like snowing or the sun is completely beating down on you or it's raining sideways. So it was a tough job. And uh, even with 50 hours a week, I wasn't making my bills and I wasn't saving enough money to go back to school the next semester. So they asked who would like to come in and run the forklift on the weekends to unload the shipments of plants. And I knew how to run a forklift. Uh, I knew how to run this particular one because it was a John Deere tractor with forks attached. <laughs> so I was like, I need the money. <laughs> like, I will come in and work weekends. So I started coming in on the weekends, got to know the management team, and they weren't happy with the safety person they had. It wasn't the right fit. There was nothing wrong with him. It just wasn't the right fit. And so they asked if I would like the job. And I had taken several safety courses in college, and it was a promotion, and I really needed it. And I was like, yes, I could do this. So that was the summer of 2009 and I was in safety for the rest of the summer and when I went back to school that fall, I changed my major and uh, honestly, I think the aptitude test was right. It's been a good career path for me and I've been in safety ever since. So I got my start in safety basically because I could run a John Deere with forklift implements on it. <laughs> Safety tech with my own consulting firm making good money in the construction field, is it really worth getting the CSP? And I'd say this is a great question. If your career is where you want it and you have more than enough work, which a lot of safety pros do, then it's a pretty tough decision to make to put in the time to get the CSP. Um, I always find a few letters be behind your name and consulting are a good thing. But what I would do in your case is I would go online to the BCSP salary survey. I'll link it below in case you need the link as well. Put in the area that you live, your years of experience, and they'll give you a number of what's average for your area. And that'll give you a good barometer of if you are at where you should be income wise, and it'll help you to make that cost benefit analysis if it's worth it to get the CSP. Okay, next question. Is your job anything like you thought it would be? Um, yeah and no. <laughs> I think the thing was, uh, I never really expected to stay employed for somebody else my entire career. One of my very early on bosses actually told me, eventually, Rachel, you're going to end up working for yourself. So just consider every job you have as training to be an entrepreneur. And I think he was right. And I, I think like I was always kind of destined to go out on my own one way or another. Um, I just didn't think it would take so much the form of like videos and e-learning and like, you know, being online and that sort of thing. But I'm glad it did. It's really interesting. It's very challenging. And I still have the technical side of safety. And I like having that technical aspect.
This one came up a couple times. Um, and it's, how do you make safety videos? And so for me, I was like, how do I answer that? Because there's two ways I can take it. Like, how do I come up with ideas? Or how do I do it from like A to Z? So I'll answer a little bit of both. So for me, um, I usually need to come up with some fun or exciting angle I want to take with the video to make it just a little bit fresh and different. Um, I can find that just by like digging into the topic usually and then finding something that matches with that. Whether it's like I want to do this style of video or I want this type of music or this animation. That's kind of how I get my start. Um, I am completely self-taught with videos. Sometimes it shows, sometimes not so much. But um, I did School of YouTube to learn how to do any of this. I now have a film crew that I work with on bigger projects or professional videos when we're doing like custom videos for companies. But before that, and even now, I make a lot of videos myself because I love doing it. And I would tell you, don't go out and invest thousands of dollars in equipment because you really don't need to. Smartphones have amazing cameras you can record in 4K and get excellent, excellent video quality with a tripod and a cell phone. The problem is gonna be having good sound quality and people will not watch videos with bad sound quality, which was a surprise to me, I had to learn that. Um, but the good news is you can go on Amazon and get a microphone, you know, that will plug right into your smartphone and will do pretty good. So I'll link some of those below so you can check them out. But yeah, all you need is like, a tripod, a cell phone, there's plenty of apps that will edit videos for you. Just dig in get, and get started. That's the best way to learn, at least in my opinion. That's how I learned everything that I do. And if you're like me and you love editing, you'll put the work in. And if you don't love editing, you won't put the work in. And so it's a good way to see if it's worth the time investment for you. If you get into it and you're like, mm -mm, <laughs> I'm not spending hours and hours doing this, it might not be the right approach or maybe it's not the right hobby. There's a lot of different ways to make videos. Mine are very editing heavy. Most people's aren't. So that's how I make videos. If you'd like to learn more about that, let me know in the comments. And also, um, I did put in an application to speak at ASSP this year and give a presentation on how to make safety videos. So we'll see if that works out. What's the best structure of a safety management system? I'm gonna give kind of a conventional answer here, but for good reason. In my opinion, the best safety management system is gonna be the ISO 45001 standard. And the reason is it's tried and tested across the whole world. It's very well known, it's easy to implement, and it also integrates with other systems well. And that also like major companies around the world use with great success. So that's where I would start. You're so young. How long have you been in the industry? Thank you for making SDS videos not terrible. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed the SDS video. Um, I'm actually not as young as I think I come across on camera. I'm 35 <laughs> and I've been in the industry more than 10 years now. So I've got a, a decent amount of experience. You know, there's always a ton to learn in safety. So yeah, after 10 years, I feel a lot more confident than I used to. And last question. What do you have in mind for us in the next year? Well, I'm super excited about 2023. I think this first month with January being all about goal setting and what we wanna accomplish in the new year and things like that is fun, it's different. Um, and I'm really glad to interact with you guys. Uh, a lot of times it's me here making videos and it seems like there's not a lot of that give and take back and forth from the audience. So I'm excited for January. Um, coming up, I'm really trying to improve my video skills. I really want to show more cinematic videos and actually show people in industry more. I would love the opportunity to do that. There's some exciting things that I've got in the works, but I don't want to speak about them until they come to fruition. But that's kind of like uh, my aspirational goals is to continue making great videos. And I don't think I need to star in all of them. I like to present, but I'd really like to like showcase people who do the work as well. That would be something that would be very meaningful to me. 
So we'll see where that goes. But I'd also like to hear from you guys. What do you want to see in 2023? What would make this channel more valuable to you, more useful, more interesting? Let me know in the comments. Again, if you're not a subscriber, make sure to subscribe because that's where I get a lot of the feedback and do polls and stuff like that and get more ideas of what videos to do. So make sure to include that. Check us out on social media. And remember, Ally Safety has tons of good resources from Toolbox Talk videos, full-length trainings, Toolbox Talk PDFs, program templates, all sorts of things. So check out AllySafety.com. And again, Happy New Year. I hope this new year is something that's exciting for you, your career, and a year where you really accomplish some goals that make you proud. All right. Till next time, I'll see you later.